Hey everyone, I finally got one of these. This is the Moto M2. Uh, this came out in 2019. Came out in 2019, and I thought to myself, let's wait a few weeks, let's get some reviews in, and then we'll order one. And we all know what happened in 2019. This resulted in the collapse of the global supply chain. But I was still very interested in one, so here we are in 2022, and I'm going to tell you about it. Now, this was interesting to me because Moto of all companies have decided to toss their horn into, if you're wondering, Mark of the Unicorn. Uh, they've tossed that in with uh, everyone else in the budget market. This is a market that has been made popular by Focusrite, the creators of the YouTuber special. Other players, you know, you have your Presodas, you have Audent, Behringer, even Universal Audio and the likes of SSL these days. But if you're going to be in the budget market, you need a gimmick. You do. Focusrite, they have an air button. Universal Audio, they have one that vintages SSL. Can't make this up. That does, in fact, say 4K. But what did Moto choose for their gimmick? Kind of an interesting choice. Check this out. Give that just one second. There we go. Unmetered bouncy VU suggestion lines. That's right. That's right. But, hey, more on that at 11. Let's take a look at the hardware itself. Solid metal case. You got some rubber feeds. Up front, you have two Motu preamps, 60 dB of gain on hand, individual phantom power switches, and monitoring. You get a monitoring line for three and four. You get a nice little volume. All these knobs are nice and chunky and real smooth. You'd expect that from Motu. And of course, volume for your headphones. On the back, it does get interesting. You might have heard that click. That's a power switch. This is something everybody, everybody should include on their audio interface because it cuts it off and that's what it does. You don't have to unplug it. And that's kind of important when you have a very bright front screen. Outside of that, hardware MIDI, not typically something you see in a audio interface in the $200 price range. Very, very nice. USB 2 in the shape of a USB-C. Check the manual before you argue with me on YouTube. I will win. Line out and monitor with RCA. Good to see. Also, the same line out and monitor in quarter inch balance like this again here's something else you don't typically see in a 200 dollars device you have lines three and four in so you can plug in outboard gear like how i tested this um preamps compressors anything like that that you just want to feed directly into this and just kind of use it as an audio converter but let's get this plugged into our linux system and find out if it can do the happy fun penguin dance Maybe you want to use your Moto M4 as an audio interface as opposed to a glorified sound card. In order to do that, I'm going to use Jack. This is a nice Jack front end called Cadence. Getting everything set up here with the ALSA driver, just making sure I have the M4 selected from the device interface. You don't need anything for input or output, but I'm going to be running at 48K 128 buffer period size of 2. Taking a look at the engine properties, everything's on default. Let's step that start button. Starts right up out of the box. Heading over to tools. Let's get a patch bay up. Katia, we have four inputs and four outputs. You can see it's automatically synced with the Pulse Audio Jack Source and Sync, and of course, hardware MIDI. Okay, moving on to Pulse Audio and Pavu Control. The M4 shows up just like any other class compliant device in Pavu Control, multi channel input, multi channel output, and of course, off. And that's going to give you the inputs and outputs as you would expect from any other USB sound card. What I'm doing now is the 10 minute torture test for the M4. I drop it into a real studio session that we use in the studio of all places. It'd be weird if I didn't use it in the studio, but I load up all the inputs and all the outputs. Basically I take a bunch of microphones, plug them in, point the business in at my professionally calibrated signal generator, Hit record and see if we generate any X runs. This is at 48K at 128. Happy to report, didn't see anything in this test, which is good. Synthetic load tests in the studio is one thing. If I get a chance, I like to test these little guys in production to see if they can get away with a show. And that's exactly what I did with episode 490 of Linux Schemecast Weekly. Three person show, plus we got some music going on. And I let it run. And what was the runtime of this one? This episode was about an hour and a half long. 
I use Harrison Mixbus. We have a dedicated DAW in the studio running Debian 11 in what about 128 buffer size at 48K for all of this. And you know what? The Moto M2 did a pretty good job. You can see these uh, little black triangles that are kind of bouncing around. I think we ended up with about seven total. And they are showing you that there was, in fact, underload. Plus, there's a lot of network audio and stuff tied into the DAW as well. So this is an absolute worst case scenario for the little Moto M4. But I think there's seven X runs in total. And it did a good job. I went back and listened to all these. And on mixed bosses like a door, it, it's real spazzy when it comes to X runs. It'll give you worst case scenario. And you have like hard X runs that cause uh, digital glitches, pops, clicks, and all that fun stuff. Then you have callbacks, which are there, but they're not audible. Happy to say all of these, not audible. Okay, let's take a look at round trip latency. This is how long it takes your audio interface to get a signal from the computer. Go through the interface and come back. This is very important for real-time monitoring, be it for musical instruments, or in my case, listening to the post-processed audio from voice when we're doing the shows. Now, the Moto M4 is not the fastest thing on the planet, but with the latency reduction in USB audio interfaces seen in kernel 515, it's still kind of amazing that we can get away with doing this using USB. Now, this is a 44.1. I will say the 512 buffer size is kind of wonky on this device. At 25.54, that should be closer to probably about 13. I believe the Scarlet Riot Solo 3rd Gen was about 13 milliseconds. But everything starts to fall in line. At 256, 13.91, 128.8.1. At 44.1, that's going to be your sweet spot right there but moving on to 48k again 512 kind of wonky at 23 256 12.89 but when we get down to 128 7.53 perfect for real-time monitoring 96k things get better 512 that's still high at 12.61 but at 256 729 that's going to be perfect for real-time monitoring plus a lot of wiggle room and all the way up to 192k even with a 512 buffer we're seeing this with the usb 7.1 milliseconds round trip latency which you could use for live monitoring drilling that all the way down to a 32 buffer size 1.28 milliseconds that's kind of impressive do we have to go all the way yes we do Maybe I can do ASMR. I'm not going to do ASMR. Uh, 60 dB of gain on tap for the M2. Having to use every last drop of it. What am I using it with? I'm currently using it with... That is my Electro Voice RE27ND. And that is flat out. According to the meters, I'm averaging somewhere around minus 10 with peaks. Very, very close to zero. And that's K14 meter on the right. So it's a little bit low a little bit low even flat out let's see if we have any noise from the preamps very very minimal but we don't want to get any louder than this are we going to clip we should have a clip line let's see if we can trip that yes we can that's unfortunate we don't want to clip that's bad but when you're coming in to an interface i see this all the time people will run home take out the brand new shiny motu m4 stab it in the face with their XLR cable and say they're using a mic like my RE27 or maybe you bought a mic, a kick drum mic like the SM7B that needs even more gain. What do you do? What do you do? You go to the internet and the internet says, hey, go buy something like this. Buy a inline phantom powered preamp. This happens to be a Clark Technic. These things are so easy to make. Cloudlifter makes them, cathedral pipes, uh, fet heads. These are all the same thing. These are not Scandinavian witchcraft. My point being, these are so easy to make. Even Clark Technic cannot mess this up. These are about 35 bucks, but you don't need it. Let me tell you why. We don't use gain in the device. We use digital trim because this is 2022. And if you clip coming into the device, that's it. Game over, man. There's nothing you can do after the fact. And anybody listening to you live, this is going to be a distortion. It's not easy to control. And getting a smaller interface like this up to line level, there's not much in the way of pad. So let me show you 
how I do it. First thing I'm going to do is we're going to use digital trim. So pay attention. I'm going to back this down. I'm going to back this down until I'm about at minus 18 dB. Then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to bring everything back up on this end like so using the digital trim. Now digital trim, this is in my DOM using Harrison Mixbus, but it doesn't matter. You can use Pavu control, just the volume slider. It's a fancy word for volume slider on your input. It's there and um, audacity, same thing, but give it a listen. I mean, I'm tracking my output, what I'm recording right now, or what would be streaming. Same volume signal to noise ratio on these devices are so good these days. You get all this wiggle room, and here's the thing. Even when I get really loud now, if you look in the right, you can see my limiter kicking in, but I'm not clipping at the device. I'm not clipping at the device whatsoever. So there is your friendly pro tip, free of charge, from old man Ven about uh, why you probably don't need a cloud lifter, but you might want to do a little bit of processing on this because you can see I do have my channel strip that I normally use. So let's cut that on and see what the Moto M4 sounds like under those conditions. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can bring this back up to level. And yeah, I want to be somewhere around minus 18 dB. Another thing you will commonly hear me um, not really complain about, but uh, mention, and I try to mention it for people's benefits, is microphones like the RE20, RE27, ND, the SM7B, Rode Procasters, they have an extremely, extraordinarily, I should say, flat response. They sound like they're underwater. They are designed. They beg. They crave processing. They expect you to run them through a basic channel strip of sorts. If you want, you don't want to do it digitally, go get a DBX, get something with a three-band parametric EQ. What I'm using right now is DSing downward expansion and uh, three band parametric EQ followed by a leveling amplifier on the end. And yeah, there you go. Mic test complete. All right, here we are at the end of the video. This is the part where I debox the interface, share my thoughts. The M4 was made to compete against the Focusrite Scarlet 4i4. It matches it pretty much feature for feature, even throws in a power switch, bankable phantom power, bankable monitoring. Round trip latency is about a millisecond slower at the same buffer size compared to the 4i4, but that's borderline rounding error territory. 260 dB preamps, low noise, and like most budget interface preamps, pretty transparent. I've always found Motu preamps just a little on the dark side, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. You do have the two line ends for external gear and two MIDI boards to round things off. Also, no drivers to install, but you will need kernel 514 or higher, unless you enjoy random audio glitches. Analog to digital, digital to analog conversion is fine for the price. Nothing earth shattering, absolutely nothing to complain about. Happy with it, I will however complain about those meters. They display a top averaging SPL of the sound instead of like rapid peaks. Zero dBFS occurs around the hex color code D0A119. And I say around since Motu didn't bother to put a scale on the meters. And while they're fun to look at, they're also a gimmick. You're not going to set accurate input levels with them. But the biggest crime is not being able to power off or at least dim those meters. Motu, I understand this is your first budget interface, but free pro tip. If the gimmick causes a hit to battery life, like in a laptop, or if it keeps the user up at night, I want to listen to music when I go to sleep, put an option in just to disable it, or at least dim it. Also, no options for rack mounting? Motu, you do that for your ultralight series. Are you trying to tell me the M4 isn't good enough to be in a rack next to an ultralight? Hmm. At the end of the day, hey, I like the M4. It's well built, sounds the business. Packs a solid punch for the price. It's not going to replace my 828 Mark III, but an ultralight Mark V just might, if I can ever find one. Seriously, Motu, how many of those did you make? 12? That's going to do it for this interfacing Linux. I'm buying these out of pocket, so if you would like to support future videos, kick us some coin on Patreon, like these lovely miscreants rolling by on your screen. Links for everything, as always, 
in the description. Head over to our web zone if you want charts and other fun things. Now get out there and make something awesome.